Good day to you all and welcome everyone to this YouTube channel. Today we present to you messages given by our Lord Jesus Christ to Anna Catherine Emmerich, a nun of the Order of St. Augustine, at the monastery in Agnettenburg, excerpts from the book The Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, part 13 from the meditations of Anna Catherine Emmerich, the temple was, however, open, the lamps lighted, and the people at liberty to enter the vestibule of the priests, which was the customary privilege of this day, as well as of that which followed the Paschal Supper. The temple was, as I said before, quite empty, with the exception of a chance priest or server who might be seen wandering about. And every part bore the marks of the confusion into which all was thrown on the previous day by the extraordinary and frightful events that had taken place, besides which it had been defiled by the presence of the dead, and I reflected and wondered in my own mind whether it would be possible ever to purify if again, the sons of Simeon, and the nephew of Joseph of Arimathea, were much grieved when they heard of the arrest of their uncle, but they welcomed the blessed virgin and her companions, and conducted them all over the temple, which they did without difficulty, as they held the offices of inspectors of the temple. The holy women stood in silence and contemplated all the terrible and visible marks of the anger of God with feelings of deep awe, and then listened with interest to the many stupendous details recounted by their guides. The effects of the earthquake were still visible, as little had been done towards repairing the numerous rents and cracks in the floor, and in the walls. In that part of the temple where the vestibule joined the sanctuary, the wall was so tremendously shaken by the shock of the earthquake, as to produce a fissure wide enough for a person to walk through, and the rest of the wall looked unsteady, as if it might fall down at any moment. The curtain which hung in the sanctuary was rent in two and hung in shreds at the sides, nothing was to be seen around but crumbled walls, crushed flagstones, and columns either partly or quite shaken down. The Blessed Virgin visited all those parts which Jesus had rendered sacred in her eyes, she prostrated, kissed them, and with tears in her eyes explained to the others her reasons for venerating each particular spot, whereupon they instantly followed her example. The greatest veneration was always shown by the Jews for all places which had been rendered sacred by manifestations of the divine power, and it was customary to place the hands reverently on such places, to kiss them, and to prostrate to the very earth before them. I do not think there was anything in the least surprising in such a custom, for they both knew, saw, and felt that the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob was a living God, and that his dwelling among his people was in the temple at Jerusalem, consequently it would have been infinitely more astonishing if they had not venerated those holy parts where his power had been particularly demonstrated, for the temple and the holy places were to them what the blessed sacrament is to Christians, deeply penetrated with these feelings of respect. The blessed virgin walked trough the temple with her companions, and pointed out to them the spot where she was presented when still a child, the parts where she passed her childhood, the place where she was affianced to Saint Joseph, and the spot where she stood when she presented Jesus and heard the prophecy of Simeon, the remembrance of his words made her weep bitterly. For the prophecy was indeed fulfilled, and the sword of grief had indeed transfixed her heart, she again stopped her companions when she reached the part of the temple where she found Jesus teaching when she lost him at the age of twelve, and she respectfully kissed the ground on which he then stood. When the holy women had looked at every place sanctified by the presence of Jesus, when they had wept and prayed over them, they returned to Shaun, the blessed virgin did not leave the temple without shedding many tears, as she contemplated the state of desolation to which it was reduced, an aspect of desolation which was rendered still more depressing by the marked contrast it bore to the usual state of the temple on the festival day. Instead of songs and hymns of jubilee, a mournful silence reigned throughout the vast edifice, and in place of groups of joyful and devout worshippers, the eye wandered over a vast and dreary solitude. Too truly, alas, did this change betoken the fearful crime which had been perpetrated by the people of God, and she remembered how Jesus had wept over the temple, and said, Destroy the temple and in three days I will build it up again. She thought over the destruction of the temple of the body of Jesus which had been brought about by his enemies, and she sighed with a longing desire for the dawning of that third day when the words of eternal truth were to be accomplished, it was about daybreak when Mary and her companions reached the Cenaculum. And they retired into the building which stood on its right-hand side, while John and some of the disciples re-entered the Cenaculum, 
where about twenty men, assembled around a lamp, were occupied in prayer. Every now and then newcomers drew nigh to the door, came in timidity, approached the group round the lamp, and addressed them in a few mournful words, which they accompanied with tears. Everyone appeared to regard John with feelings, of respect, because he had remained with Jesus until he expired, but with these sentiments of respect was mingled a deep feeling of shame and confusion, when they reflected on their own cowardly conduct in abandoning their Lord and Master in the hour of need. John spoke to everyone with the greatest charity and kindness, his manner was modest and unassuming as that of a child, and he seemed to fear receiving praise. I saw the assembled group take one meal during that day, but its members were, for the most part, silent, not a sound was to be heard throughout the house, and the doors were tightly closed, although, in fact, there was no likelihood of anyone disturbing them, as the house belonged to Nicodemus, and he had led it to them for the time of the festival, the holy women remained in this room until nightfall, it was lighted up by a single lamp, the doors were closed, and curtains drawn over them. Windows Sometimes they gathered round the Blessed Virgin and prayed under the lamp. At other times they retired to the side of the room, covered their heads with black veils, and either sat on ashes, the sign of mourning, or prayed with their faces turned towards the wall, those whose health was delicate took a little food, but the others fasted, I looked at them again and again, and I saw them ever occupied in the same manner, that is to say, either in prayer or in mourning over the sufferings of their beloved Master. When my thoughts wandered from the contemplation of the Blessed Virgin to that of her Divine Son, I beheld the Holy Sepulchre with six or seven sentinels at the entrance, Cassia standing against the door of the cave, apparently in deep meditation. The exterior door closed, and the stone rolled close to it. Notwithstanding the thick door which intervened between the body of our Saviour and myself I could see it plainly, it was quite transparent with a divine light, and two angels were adoring at the side. But my thoughts then turned to the contemplation of the blessed soul of my Redeemer, and such an extensive and complicated picture of his descent into hell was shown to me, that I can only remember a small portion of it, which I will describe to the best of my power, chapter 59, a detached account of the descent into hell, when Jesus, after uttering a loud cry, expired. I saw his heavenly soul under the form of a bright meteor pierce the earth at the foot of the cross accompanied by the angel Gabriel and many other angels. His divine nature continued united to his soul as well as to his body, which still remained hanging upon the cross, but I cannot explain how this was, although I saw it plainly in my own mind. The place into which the soul of Jesus entered was divided into three parts, which appeared to me like three worlds, and I felt that they were round, and that each division was separated from the other by a hemisphere, I beheld a bright and beautiful space opposite to Limbo, it was enameled with flowers, delicious breezes wafted through it, and many souls were placed there before being admitted into heaven after their deliverance from purgatory. Limbo, the place where the souls were waiting for the redemption, was divided into different compartments and encompassed by a thick foggy atmosphere. Our Lord appeared radiant with light and surrounded by angels, who conducted him triumphantly between two of these compartments, the one on the left containing the patriarchs who lived before the time of Abraham, and that on the right those who lived between the days of Abraham and St. John the Baptist. These souls did not at first recognize Jesus, but were filled nevertheless with sensations of joy and hope. There was not a spot in those narrow confines which did not, as it were, dilate with feelings of happiness. The passage of Jesus might be compared to the wafting of a breath of air, to a sudden flash of light, or to a shower of vivifying dew, but it was swift as a whirlwind. After passing through the two compartments, he reached a dark spot in which Adam and Eve were standing, he spoke to them, they prostrated and adored him in a perfect ecstasy of joy, and they immediately joined the band of angels, and accompanied our Lord to the compartment on the left, which contained the patriarchs who lived before Abraham. This compartment was a species of purgatory, and a few evil spirits were wandering about among the souls and endeavoring to fill them with anxiety and alarm. The entrance through a species of door was closed, but the angels rapped, and I thought I heard them say, Open these doors. When Jesus entered in triumph the demons dispersed, crying out at the same time, What is there between thee and us? What art thou come to do here? Wilt thou crucify us likewise? 
The angels hunted them away, having first chained them. The poor souls confined in this place had only a slight presentiment and vague idea of the presence of Jesus, but the moment he told them that it was he himself, they burst out into acclamations of joy, and welcomed him with hymns of rapture and delight. The soul of our Lord then wended its way to the right, towards that part which really constituted limbo, and there he met the soul of the good thief which angels were carrying to Abraham's bosom. As also that of the bad thief being dragged by demons into hell. Our Lord addressed a few words to both, and then entered Abraham's bosom, accompanied by numerous angels and holy souls, and also by those demons who had been chained and expelled from the compartment. This locality appeared to me more elevated than the surrounding parts, and I can only describe my sensations on entering it, by comparing them to those of a person coming suddenly into the interior of a church, after having been for some time in the burial vaults. The demons, who were strongly chained, were extremely loath to enter, and resisted to the utmost of their power, but the angels compelled them to go forwards. All the just who had lived before the time of Christ were assembled there, the patriarchs, Moses, the judges, and the kings on the left-hand side, and on the right side, the prophets, and the ancestors of our Lord, as also his near relations, such as Joachim, Anna, Joseph, Zacharias, Elizabeth, and John. There were no demons in this place, and the only discomfort that had been felt by those placed there was a longing desire for the accomplishment of the promise, and when our Lord entered they saluted him with joyful hymns of gratitude and thanksgiving for its fulfillment, they prostrated and adored him. And the evil spirits who had been dragged into Abraham's bosom when our Lord entered were compelled to confess with shame that they were vanquished. Many of these holy souls were ordered by our Lord to return to the earth, re-enter their own bodies, and thus render a solemn and impressive testimony to the truth. It was at this moment that so many dead persons left their tombs in Jerusalem, I regarded them less in the light of dead persons risen again than as corpses put in motion by a divine power, and which, after having fulfilled the mission entrusted to them, were laid aside in the same manner as the insignia of office are taken off by a clerk when he has executed the orders of his superiors, I next saw our Lord, with his triumphant procession, enter into a species of purgatory which was filled with those good pagans who, having had a faint glimmering of the truth, had longed for its fulfillment, this purgatory was very deep, and contained a few demons compelled to confess the deception they had practiced with regard to these idols, and the souls of the poor pagans cast themselves at the feet of Jesus, and adored him with inexpressible joy, here, likewise, the demons were bound with chains and dragged away. I saw our Savior perform many other actions, but I suffered so intensely at the same time, that I cannot recount them as I should have wished, finally, I beheld him approach to the center of the great abyss, that is to say, to hell itself, and the expression of his countenance was most severe. The exterior of hell was appalling and frightful, it was an immense, heavy-looking building, and the granite of which it was formed, although black, was of metallic brightness, and the dark and ponderous doors were secured with such terrible bolts that no one could behold them without trembling. Deep groans and cries of despair might be plainly distinguished even while the doors were tightly closed, but, oh, who can describe the dreadful yells and shrieks which burst upon the ear when the bolts were unfastened and the doors flung open, and, oh, who can depict the melancholy appearance of the inhabitants of this wretched place. The form under which the heavenly Jerusalem is generally represented in my visions is that of a beautiful and well-regulated city. And the different degrees of glory to which the elect are raised are demonstrated by the magnificence of their palaces, or the wonderful fruit and flowers with which the gardens are embellished. Hell is shown to me under the same form, but all within it is, on the contrary, close, confused, and crowded, every object tends to fill the mind with sensations of pain and grief, the marks of the wreath and vengeance of God are visible everywhere, despair, like a vulture, does every heart, and discord and misery reign around. In the heavenly Jerusalem all is peace and eternal harmony, the beginning, fulfillment, and end of everything being pure and perfect happiness, the city is filled with splendid buildings. Decorated in such a manner as to charm every eye and enrapture every sense, the inhabitants of this delightful abode are overflowing with rapture and exultation, the gardens gay with lovely flowers, and the trees covered with delicious fruits which give eternal life. 
In the city of hell nothing is to be seen but dismal dungeons, dark caverns, frightful deserts, fetid swamps filled with every imaginable species of poisonous and disgusting reptile. In heaven you behold the happiness and peaceful union of the saints, in hell, perpetual scenes of wretched discord, and every species of sin and corruption, either under the most horrible forms imaginable, or represented by different kinds of dreadful torments. All in this dreary abode tends to fill the mind with horror, not a word of comfort is heard or a consoling idea admitted, the one tremendous thought, that the justice of an all-powerful God inflicts on the damned nothing but what they have fully deserved is the absorbing tremendous conviction which weighs down each heart. Vice appears in its own grim disgusting colors, being stripped of the mask under which it is hidden in this world, and the infernal viper is seen devouring those who have cherished or fostered it here below. In a word, hell is the temple of anguish and despair, while the kingdom of God is the temple of peace and happiness. This is easy to understand when seen. But it is almost impossible to describe clearly, the tremendous explosion of oaths, curses, cries of despair, and frightful exclamations which, like a clap of thunder, burst forth when the gates of hell were thrown open by the angels, would be difficult even to imagine, our Lord spoke first to the soul of Judas, and the angels then compelled all the demons to acknowledge and adore Jesus. They would have infinitely preferred the most frightful torments to such a humiliation, but all were obliged to submit. Many were chained down in a circle which was placed round other circles. In the center of hell I saw a dark and horrible looking abyss, and into this Lucifer was cast, after being first strongly secured with chains. Thick clouds of sulfurous black smoke arose from its fearful depths, and enveloped his frightful form in the dismal folds, thus effectually concealing him from every beholder. God himself had decreed this, and I was likewise told, if I remember right, that he will be unchained for a time fifty or sixty years before the year of Christ 2000. The dates of many other events were pointed out to me which I do not now remember, but a certain number of demons are to be let loose much earlier than Lucifer, in order to tempt men, and to serve as instruments of the divine vengeance. I should think that some must be loosened even in the present day, and others will be set free in a short time. It would be utterly impossible for me to describe all the things which were shown to me, their number was so great that I could not reduce them sufficiently to order to define and render them intelligible. Besides which my sufferings are very great, and when I speak on the subject of my visions I behold them in my mind's eye portrayed in such vivid colors, that the sight is almost sufficient to cause a weak mortal like myself to expire, I next saw innumerable bands of redeemed souls liberated from purgatory and from limbo, who followed our Lord to a delightful spot situated above the celestial Jerusalem, in which place I, a very short time ago, saw the soul of a person who was very dear to me. The soul of the good thief was likewise taken there, and the promise of our Lord, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise, was fulfilled, it is not in my power to explain the exact time that each of these events occurred, nor can I relate one half of the things which I saw and heard, for some were incomprehensible even to myself and others would be misunderstood if I attempted to relate them. I have seen our Lord in many different places. Even in the sea he appeared to me to sanctify and deliver everything in the creation. Evil spirits fled at his approach, and cast themselves into the dark abyss. I likewise beheld his soul in different parts of the earth, first inside the tomb of Adam. Under Golgotha, and when he was there the souls of Adam and Eve came up to him, and he spoke to them for some time. He then visited the tombs of the prophets, who were buried at an immense depth below the surface, but he passed through the soil in the twinkling of an eye. Their souls immediately re-entered their bodies, and he spoke to them, and explained the most wonderful mysteries. Next I saw him, accompanied by a chosen band of prophets, among whom I particularly remarked David, visit those parts of the earth which had been sanctified by his miracles and by his sufferings. He pointed out to them, with the greatest love and goodness, the different symbols in the old law expressive of the future. And he showed them how he himself had fulfilled every prophecy. The sight of the soul of our Lord, surrounded by these happy souls, and radiant with light, was inexpressibly grand as he glided triumphantly through the air, sometimes passing, with the velocity of lightning, over rivers, then penetrating though the hardest rocks to the very center of the earth, or moving noiselessly over its surface. 
I can remember nothing beyond the facts which I have just related concerning the descent of Jesus into limbo, where he went in order to present to the souls. There detained the grace of the redemption which he had merited for them by his death and by his sufferings, and I saw all these things in a very short space of time. In fact, time passed so quickly that it seemed to me but a moment. Our Lord, however, displayed before me, at the same time, another picture, in which I beheld the immense mercies which he bestows in the present day on the poor souls in purgatory, for on every anniversary of this great day, when his church is celebrating the glorious mystery of his death, he casts a look of compassion on the souls in purgatory, and frees some of those who sinned against him before his crucifixion. I this day saw Jesus deliver many souls, some I was acquainted with, and others were strangers to me, but I cannot name any of them, our Lord, by descending into hell, planted, if I may thus express myself. In the spiritual garden of the church, a mysterious tree, the fruits of which, namely, his merits, are destined for the constant relief of the poor souls in purgatory. The church militant must cultivate the tree, and gather its fruit, in order to present them to that suffering portion of the church which can do nothing for itself. Thus it is with all the merits of Christ, we must labor with him if we wish to obtain our share of them, we must gain our bread by the sweat of our brow. Everything which our Lord has done for us in time must produce fruit for eternity, but we must gather these fruits in time, without which we cannot possess them in eternity. The Church is the most prudent and thoughtful of mothers. The ecclesiastical year is an immense and magnificent garden, in which all those fruits for eternity are gathered together, that we may make use of them in time. Each year contains sufficient to supply the wants of all, but woe be to that careless or dishonest gardener who allows any of the fruit committed to his care to perish, if he fails to turn to a proper account those graces which would restore health to the sick, strength to the weak, or furnish food to the hungry. When the day of judgment arrives, the master of the garden will demand a strict account, not only of every tree, but also of all the fruit produced in the garden, chapter 60, the eve of the resurrection, towards the close of the Sabbath day. John came to see the holy women. He endeavored to give some consolation, but could not restrain his own tears, and only remained a short time with them. They had likewise a short visit from Peter and James the Greater, after which they retired to their cells, and gave free vent to grief, sitting upon ashes, and veiling themselves even more closely, the prayer of the Blessed Virgin was unceasing. She ever kept her eyes fixed interiorly on Jesus, and was perfectly consumed by her ardent desire of once more beholding him whom she loved with such inexpressible love. Suddenly an angel stood by her side, and bade her arise and go to the door of the dwelling of Nicodemus, for that the Lord was very near. The heart of the Blessed Virgin leaped for joy. She hastily wrapped her cloak about her, and left the holy women, without informing them where she was going. I saw her walk quickly to a small entrance which was cut in the town wall, the identical one through which she had entered when returning with her companions from the sepulchre, it was about nine o'clock at night, and the Blessed Virgin had almost reached the entrance, when I saw her stop suddenly in a very solitary spot, and look upwards in an ecstasy of delight, for on the top of the town wall she beheld the soul of our Lord, resplendent with light, without the appearance of a wound, and surrounded by patriarchs. He descended towards her, turned to his companions, and presenting her to them, said, Behold Mary, behold my mother. He appeared to me to salute her with a kiss, and he then disappeared. The Blessed Virgin knelt down, and most reverently kissed the ground on which he had stood, and the impression of her hands and knees remained imprinted upon the stones. The sight filled her with inexpressible joy, and she immediately rejoined the holy women, who were busily employed in preparing the perfumes and spices. She did not tell them what she had seen, but her firmness and strength of mind was restored. She was perfectly renovated, and therefore comforted all the rest, and endeavored to strengthen their faith. All the holy women were sitting by a long table, the cover of which hung down to the floor, when Mary returned, bundles of herbs were heaped around them, and these they mixed together and arranged, small flasks, containing sweet unctions and water of spikenard, were standing near, as also bunches of natural flowers, among which I remarked one in particular, which was like a streaked iris or a lily. 
Magdalene, Mary the daughter of Cleophas, Salome, Johanna, and Mary Salome, had bought all these things in the town during the absence of Mary. Their intention was to go to the sepulchre before sunrise on the following day, in order to strew these flowers and perfumes over the body of their beloved master. Chapter 61 Joseph of Arimathea miraculously said at large, a short time after the return of the Blessed Virgin to the Holy Women, I was shown the interior of the prison in which the enemies of Joseph of Arimathea had confined him. He was praying fervently, when suddenly a brilliant light illuminated the whole place, and I heard a voice calling him by name, while at the same moment the roof opened, and a bright form appeared, holding out a sheet resembling that in which he had wrapped the body of Jesus. Joseph grasped it with both hands, and was drawn up to the opening, which closed again as soon as he had passed through, and the apparition disappeared the instant he was in safety at the top of the tower. I know not whether it was our Lord himself or an angel who thus set Joseph free, he walked on the summit of the wall until he reached the neighborhood of the Cenaculum, which was near to the south wall of Shaum, and then climbed down and knocked at the door of that edifice, as the doors were fastened. The disciples assembled there had been much grieved when they first missed Joseph, who they thought had been thrown into a sink, a report to that effect having become current. Great, therefore, was their joy when they opened the door and found that it was he himself, indeed, they were almost as much delighted as when Peter was miraculously delivered from prison some years after. When Joseph had related what had taken place, they were filled with astonishment and delight, and after thanking God fervently gave him some refreshment, which he greatly needed. He left Jerusalem that same night, and fled to Arimathea, his native place, where he remained until he thought he could return safely to Jerusalem, I likewise saw Cephas towards the close of the Sabbath day, at the house of Nicodemus. He was conversing with him and asking many questions with pretended kindness. Nicodemus answered firmly, and continued to affirm the innocence of Jesus. They did not remain long together, chapter 62, the night of resurrection, I soon after beheld the tomb of our Lord. All was calm and silent around it. There were six soldiers on guard, who were either seated or standing before the door, and Cassius was among them. His appearance was that of a person immersed in meditation and in the expectation of some great event. The sacred body of our blessed Redeemer was wrapped in the winding sheet, and surrounded with light, while two angels sat in an attitude of adoration, the one at the head, and the other at the feet. I had seen them in the same posture ever since he was first put into the tomb. These angels were clothed as priests. Their position, and the manner in which they crossed their arms over their breasts, reminded me of the cherubim who surrounded the Ark of the Covenant, only they were without wings, at least I did not see any. The whole of the sepulchre reminded me of the Ark of the Covenant at different periods of its history. It is possible that Cassius was sensible of the presence of the angels, and of the bright light which filled the sepulchre, for his attitude was like that of a person in deep contemplation before the blessed sacrament. I next saw the soul of our Lord accompanied by those among the patriarchs whom he had liberated enter into the tomb through the rock. He showed them the wounds with which his sacred body was covered, and it seemed to me that the winding sheet which previously enveloped it was removed, and that Jesus wished to show the souls the excess of suffering he had endured to redeem them. The body appeared to me to be quite transparent, so that the whole depth of the wounds could be seen, and this sight filled the holy souls with admiration, although deep feelings of compassion likewise drew tears from their eyes, my next vision was so mysterious that I cannot explain or even relate it in a clear manner. It appeared to me that the soul and body of Jesus were taken together out of the sepulchre, without, however, the former being completely reunited to the latter, which still remained inanimate. I thought I saw two angels who were kneeling and adoring at the head and feet of the sacred body, raise it, keeping it in the exact position in which it was lying in the tomb, and carry it uncovered and disfigured with wounds across the rock, which trembled as they passed. It then appeared to me that Jesus presented his body, marked with the stigmas of the Passion, to his heavenly Father, who, seated on a throne, was surrounded by innumerable choirs of angels, blissfully occupied in pouring forth hymns of adoration and jubilee. The case was probably the same when at the death of our Lord, 
so many holy souls re-entered their bodies, and appeared in the temple and in different parts of Jerusalem, for it is not likely that the bodies which they animated were really alive, as in that case they would have been obliged to die a second time, whereas they returned to their original state without apparent difficulty. But it is to be supposed that their appearance in human form was similar to that of our Lord. When he, if we may thus express it, accompanied his body to the throne of his heavenly Father, at this moment the rock was so violently shaken, from the very summit to the base, that three of the guards fell down and became almost insensible. The other four were away at the time, being gone to the town to fetch something. The guards who were thus thrown prostrate attributed the sudden shock to an earthquake, but Cassius, who, although uncertain as to what all this might portend, yet felt an inward presentiment that it was the prelude to some stupendous event, stood transfixed in anxious expectation, waiting to see what would follow next. The soldiers who were gone to Jerusalem soon returned. I again beheld the holy women, they had finished preparing the spices, and were resting in their private cells, not stretched out on the couches, but leaning against the bedclothes, which were rolled up. They wished to go to the sepulchre before the break of day, because they feared meeting the enemies of Jesus, but the blessed virgin, who was perfectly renovated and filled with fresh courage since she had seen her son, consoled and recommended them to sleep for a time, and then go fearlessly to the tomb, as no harm would come to them, whereupon they immediately followed her advice, and endeavored to sleep. It was towards eleven o'clock at night when the blessed virgin, incited by irrepressible feelings of love, arose, wrapped a grey cloak around her, and left the house quite alone. When I saw her do this, I could not help feeling anxious, and saying to myself, how is it possible for this holy mother, who is so exhausted from anguish and terror, to venture to walk all alone through the streets at such an hour? I saw her go first to the house of Cephas, and then to the palace of Pilate, which was at a great distance off, I watched her through the whole of her solitary journey along that part which had been trodden by her son, loaded with his heavy cross, she stopped at every place where our Saviour had suffered particularly, or had received any fresh outrage from his barbarous enemies. Her appearance, as she walked slowly along, was that of a person seeking something, she often bent down to the ground, touched the stones with her hands, and then inundated them with kisses, if the precious blood of her beloved son was upon them. God granted her at this time particular lights and graces, and she was able without the slightest degree of difficulty to distinguish every place sanctified by his sufferings. I accompanied her through the whole of her pious pilgrimage, and I endeavored to imitate her to the best of my power, as far as my weakness would permit. Mary then went to Calvary, but when she had almost reached it, she stopped suddenly, and I saw the sacred body and soul of our Savior standing before her. An angel walked in front, the two angels whom I had seen in the tomb were by his side, and the souls whom he had redeemed followed him by hundreds. The body of Jesus was brilliant and beautiful, but its appearance was not that of a living body, although a voice issued from it, and I heard him describe to the blessed virgin all he had done in limbo, and then assure her that he should rise again with his glorified body, that he would then show himself to her, and that she must wait near the rock of Mount Calvary, and that part where she saw him fall down until he appeared. Our Saviour then went towards Jerusalem, and the Blessed Virgin, having again wrapped her veil about her, prostrated on the spot which he had pointed out. It was then, I think, past midnight, for the pilgrimage of Mary over the way of the cross had taken up at least an hour, and I next saw the holy souls who had been redeemed by our Saviour traverse in their turn the sorrowful way of the cross, and contemplate the different places where he had endured such fearful sufferings for their sakes. The angels who accompanied them gathered sacred flesh which had been torn off by the frequent blows he received, as also the blood with which the ground was sprinkled on those spots where he had fallen, I once more saw the sacred body of our Lord stretched out as I first beheld it in the sepulchre, the angels were occupied in replacing the garments they had gathered up of his flesh. And they received supernatural assistance in doing this. When next I contemplated him it was in his winding sheet, surrounded with a bright light and with two adoring angels by his side. I cannot explain how all these things came to pass, for they are far beyond our human comprehension, and even if I understand them perfectly myself when I see them, they appear dark and mysterious when I endeavor to explain them to others, as soon as a faint glimmering of dawn appeared in the east, I saw Magdalene, 
Mary the daughter of Cleophas, Johanna Chusa, and Salome, leave the Sennaculum, closely wrapped up in their mantles. They carried bundles of spices, and one of their number had a lighted candle in her hand, which she endeavored to conceal under her cloak. I saw them direct their trembling steps towards the small door at the house of Nicodemus, chapter 63, the resurrection of our Lord, I beheld the soul of our Lord between two angels, who were in the attire of warriors, it was bright, luminous, and resplendent as the sun at midday, it penetrated the rock, touched the sacred body, passed into it, and the two were instantaneously united, and became as one. I then saw the limbs move, and the body of our Lord, being reunited to his soul and to his divinity, rise and shake off the winding sheet, the whole of the cave was illuminated and lightsome, at the same moment I saw a frightful monster burst from the earth underneath the sepulchre. It had the tail of a serpent, and it raised its dragon head proudly as if desirous of attacking Jesus, and had likewise, if I remember correctly, a human head. But our Lord held in his hand a white staff, to which was appended a large banner, and he placed his foot on the head of the dragon, and struck its tail three times with his staff, after which the monster disappeared. I had had this same vision many times before the resurrection, and I saw just such a monster, appearing to endeavor to hide itself, at the time of the conception of our Lord, it greatly resembled the serpent which tempted our first parents in paradise, only it was more horrible. I thought that this vision had reference to the prophetic words. That, by the seed of the woman the head of the serpent should be crushed, and that the whole was intended to demonstrate the victory of our Lord over death, for at the same moment that I saw him crush the head of the monster, the tomb likewise vanished from my sight, I then saw the glorified body of our Lord rise up, and it passed through the hard rock as easily as if the latter had been formed of some ductile substance. The earth shook, and an angel in the garb of a warrior descended from heaven with the speed of lightning, entered the tomb, lifted the stone, placed it on the right side, and seated himself upon it. At this tremendous sight the soldiers fell to the ground, and remained there apparently lifeless. When Cassius saw the bright light which illuminated the tomb, he approached the place where the sacred body had been placed, looked at and touched the linen clothes in which it had been wrapped, and left the sepulchre, intending to go and inform Pilate of all that had happened. However, he tarried a short time to watch the progress of events, for although he had felt the earthquake, seen the angel move the stone, and looked at the empty tomb, yet he had not seen Jesus, at the very moment in which the angel entered the sepulchre and the earth quaked, I saw our Lord appear to his holy mother on Calvary. His body was beautiful and lightsome, and its beauty was that of a celestial being. He was clothed in a large mantle, which at one moment looked dazzlingly white, as it floated through the air, waving to and fro with every breath of wind, and the next reflected a thousand brilliant colors as the sunbeams passed over it. His large open wounds shone brightly, and could be seen from a great distance, the wounds in his hands were so large that a finger might be put into them without difficulty, and rays of light proceeded from them, diverging in the direction of his fingers. The souls of the patriarchs bowed down before the mother of our Savior, and Jesus spoke to her concerning his resurrection, telling her many things which I have forgotten. He showed her his wounds. And Mary prostrated to kiss his sacred feet, but he took her hand, raised her, and disappeared. When I was at some distance from the sepulcher I saw fresh lights burning there, and I likewise beheld a large luminous spot in the sky immediately over Jerusalem. This is the end of today's message. May God bless you and keep you close to his heart. Amen.